This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 7. Coming up on Space Time, New Zealand's new electron rocket reaches orbit. A new study into how our sun is changing. And China's Tiangong-1 space lab expected to crash back to Earth in March. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New Zealand has successfully placed the spacecraft into orbit for the first time. Rocket Lab's unmanned electron launch vehicle, named Still Testing, blasted off from the Mahia Peninsula launch pad on Sunday afternoon. Rocket Lab's Auckland Mission Control Centre erupted into cheers as the 17-metre-long spacecraft streaked skywards. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Ignition. Guidance is nominal. Max dynamic pressure approaching. Max dynamic pressure. Altitude 20 kilometers. Staging. Stage one, Miko. Stage two, start up. Stage two, engine ignited. Stage two, propulsion nominal. Vehicle is stable. Following nominal IRP track. Southland is above horizon, awaiting his band shutdown and UHF startup. Fairing separation. 10 seconds. 5 seconds. Vehicle is orbital. Shutdown. Engine shutdown. We've got confirmation of payload deploy orbit insertion, which wraps up the initial part of our mission with a successful insertion into orbit. Rocket Lab's previous launch back in May 2017 reached space but failed to achieve orbit. The successful launch followed multiple mission scrubs for the flight due to strong high-level winds, a sudden power issue, and problems with the rocket's liquid oxygen feed. Once in orbit, the Electron rocket successfully deployed its payload of three small satellites into low-Earth orbit. The payloads include an Earth imaging satellite for San Francisco company Planet Labs and two satellites to monitor weather and track shipping for another San Francisco-based company, Spy Global. Rocket Lab plans to conduct at least three more flight tests before it begins commercial operations. The company plans to launch an average of at least two rockets per week from its Mahia Peninsula launch complex on the North Island's east coast between Napier and Gisborne. The Rocket Lab Electron is a small-capacity two-stage launch vehicle designed to carry CubeSat payloads of up to 225 kilograms into low-Earth orbit and 150 kilograms into sun-synchronous orbits up to 500 kilometres in altitude. Electron uses two 1.2-metre diameter stages, each running RP-1 kerosene propellant and a liquid oxygen oxidizer. The first stage is equipped with nine electrically pump-fed Rutherford rocket engines, while the upper stage uses a single vacuum-optimised Rutherford engine. The Electron rocket uses an all-carbon composite design, giving it an all-up launch mass of about 12.5 tonnes. The Electron's Rutherford rocket motors are the first electric pump-fed 3D printed engines to fly in space. Two brushless DC motors powered by 13 lithium polymer batteries deliver over a megawatt of power to spin each engine's turbo pump machinery at up to 40,000 RPM during the two and a half minutes of the first stage rocket burn. A 22 kilonewton vacuum-optimised Rutherford engine powers the Electron's upper stage using three battery packs to drive its pumps. Two of these battery packs are jettisoned during the flight. On top of the upper stage is Rocket Lab's plug-in payload adapter, which can be used to carry up to 82 CubeSats per launch. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have caught a monster black hole in a distant galaxy snacking on gas and then burping, not once but twice. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, show two separate episodes of feeding frenzy by a supermassive black hole at the centre of a galaxy called SDSS J1354 plus 1328, located in the northern skies about 800 million light years away. The authors made their discovery using NASA's Chandra X-ray and Hubble Space Telescopes, as well as the giant Keck Observatory atop of Mauna Kea in Hawaii and the Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. Chandra detected a bright point-like source of X-ray emissions from the galaxy, a telltale sign for the presence of a supermassive black hole millions to billions of times the mass of the Sun. The X-rays are produced by material being consumed by the black hole. 
This material is being crushed, stretched and torn apart at the subatomic level by enormous gravitational and magnetic forces as it falls onto an accretion disk forming around the black hole. In the process, the material is heated to millions of degrees, generating X-rays. Now, eventually, most of this material will pass a point of no return called the event horizon and fall forever into the black hole's singularity, with the rest guided along magnetic field lines and fired out into space as powerful jets of high-energy particles. By comparing the X-ray images from Chandra with optical light images from Hubble, the authors were able to confirm that the source was at the very centre of the galaxy, exactly where a supermassive black hole would be. The X-ray data also provided evidence that this supermassive black hole was embedded in a heavy veil of gas and dust. And astronomers were able to pick out regions north and south of the black hole, which had become ionised by large blasts from the outflow of high-energy particles. The outflow eventually switched off and then turned back on again about 100,000 years later, indicating the black hole must have had two separate meals. And the reason why it had two separate meals lies in a companion galaxy that's linked to J1354 by streams of gas and stars produced through a collision between the two galaxies. The authors conclude that the clumps of material from the companion galaxy swirled towards and were eventually eaten by the supermassive black hole. Optical observations from Hubble, Keck and Apache Point were able to detect electrons stripped off atoms in a cone of gas extending some 30,000 light years south from the galactic centre. This stripping was likely caused by a burst of radiation from the black hole, indicating a feasting event had occurred. And to the north, astronomers found evidence of a shockwave, similar to a sonic boom, located about 3,000 light years from the black hole. And this suggests that a different clump of gas had been consumed roughly 100,000 years later. The researchers were also able to show that the gas coming from the northern part of the galaxy was consistent with the advancing edge of a shockwave, while the gas from the south was consistent with an older outflow from the black hole. Of course, these events aren't unique, nor do they only happen in distant galaxies. Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, has also experienced at least one giant galactic burp. Back in 2010, astronomers using NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope discovered two huge gas outflows shining brightly in gamma rays, X-rays and radio wave bubbles. These two clouds extend thousands of light years above and below the galactic bulge. These so-called Fermi bubbles are clear evidence that the Milky Way's usually quiet supermassive black hole has had its own mass-feeding events in the past. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Like the waistband of a couch potato in midlife, the orbits of planets in our solar system are expanding. It happens because the Sun's gravitational grip is slowly, gradually weakening as our star ages and burns off mass. Now, NASA and MIT scientists have indirectly measured this mass loss and other solar parameters by looking for changes not in the Sun, but in the orbit of the planet Mercury. The new values improve upon earlier predictions by reducing the amount of uncertainty. That's especially important for the rate of solar mass loss, because that relates directly to the stability of the big G, the gravitational constant. Although G is considered a fixed number, whether it's really constant is still a fundamental question in physics. The study's lead author is Antonio Genova from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. He says Mercury is the perfect object for these experiments because it's so sensitive to the gravitational effect and activity of the Sun. The new findings have been published in the journal Nature Communications. The authors began by improving Mercury's chartered ephemeris, the roadmap of the planet's position in the sky over time. To achieve that, the team drew on radio tracking data that monitored the location of NASA's MESSENGER spacecraft during its mission. The MESSENGER probe undertook three flybys of Mercury in 2008 and 2009 before finally achieving orbit insertion around the planet nearest the Sun in March 2011 and remaining in orbit until April 2015. 
The scientists then work backwards, analysing subtle changes in Mercury's motion as a way of learning about the Sun and how its physical parameters are influencing the planet's orbit. For centuries, scientists have studied Mercury's motion, paying particular attention to its perihelion, its closest orbital position to the Sun. Observations long ago revealed perihelion shifts over time, known as precession. Although gravitational tugs from the other planets in the solar system do account for most of Mercury's precession, they don't account for all of it. The second largest contribution comes from the actual warping of space-time around the Sun because of the star's own gravity. And that's covered by Professor Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. In fact, it was the success of general relativity in explaining most of Mercury's remaining precession which helped persuade scientists that Einstein's theory was right. Other much smaller contributions to Mercury's precession are attributed to the Sun's interior structure and dynamics. One of those is the Sun's oblateness, a measure of how much it bulges at the equator rather than it being a perfect sphere. The authors were able to separate some of the solar parameters from the relativistic effects, something which had not been accomplished by earlier studies that relied on ephemeris data. Jennifer and colleagues then developed a novel technique that simultaneously estimated and integrated the orbits of both Messenger and Mercury, leading to a comprehensive solution which included quantities related to the evolution of the Sun's interior and to relativistic effects. The team's new estimate of the rate of solar mass loss represents one of the first times that this value has been constrained based on observations rather than theoretical calculations. From the theoretical work, scientists had previously predicted a loss of about one-tenth of a percent of the Sun's overall mass over 10 billion years. And that's enough to reduce the star's gravitational pull and allow the orbits of the planets to spread out by as much as half an inch, or 1.5 centimetres per year, per astronomical unit. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. It equates to about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. The new value is only slightly lower than earlier predictions, but has far less uncertainty. And that makes it possible to improve the stability of G by a factor of 10, compared to values derived from studies of the motion of the Moon. And mass loss isn't the only change in the Sun that's going on. It might also be undergoing some internal magnetic changes as well, Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, joins us now with the details. Yes, yeah, some interesting stuff in the February issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. We look at the question, is there something strange happening with our sun? Is it on the verge of undergoing some major changes? Now, of course, the sun's pretty important to us, isn't it? It's basically the source of energy from pretty much everything on Earth, aside from some uh, residual heat that we've got under the ground. So, uh, yeah, we, we've always been very interested in the sun, and the scientists have been studying it for centuries. And what they found is that there, there could be, and I re- emphasise the could, there could be some long-term changes going on with uh, the way the sun's magnetic field is operating. Now, just like the Earth, the sun's got a magnetic field. And the magnetic field in the sun actually is responsible for the 11-year sunspot cycle that sort of everyone knows about. The sun, sun goes through a cycle, uh, and you get lots of sunspots spots at some times and fewer sunspots at other times. You get lots of activity and flares and things at uh, times of uh, solar maximum, they call it. You get fewer events, solar activity and flares and things at the solar minimum time. In fact, we're at solar minimum right now, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, and, and even being at solar minimum or we're heading around that area, we're still getting lots of lovely aurora happening in the far north of um, Earth and far south of here. Yeah, it's been another G-class event just in the last week or so. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You get to see these beautiful aurora. That's when charged particles from the sun sort of spewed out uh, from the sun and hit the Earth's uh, uh, magnetic bubble and spiral down and interact with the atmosphere and we get all this beautiful, um, beautiful, lovely colours in the sky. But anyway, yeah, there could be long-term changes going on in inside the sun. The familiar 11-year sunspot cycle has going, been going on for at least 300 million years, which is a very long time as far as humans are concerned, but not necessarily that long in, in the terms of the age of the universe. And the sunspots are the clue to what's happening inside the sun because the, they are comparatively cooler regions where the solar magnetic field gets, sort of gets bottled up or dammed up and stops hot gases from flowing into that particular part of the sun. And the location of these sort of magnetic dams and how many of, there are, how many of them there are are clues to what's going on inside. There's some evidence that the solar cycle is experiencing some sort of long-term decline by studying other stars, actually, using uh, space telescopes, and other stars have sunspots as well, astronomers have found that it's possible that our solar cycle will eventually come to a halt. I'm not saying it will, but it's possible that it might. And a new space mission that's going to be launched this year called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, will study thousands more stars and is going to monitor their sunspot cycles. Now, these space missions, they don't last very long in, in you know, 
in astronomical terms, but by studying thousands and thousands of different stars, all of them at different stages of their stellar lives, you can build up some good statistics of what sort of activity happens at different stages of a star's life. So maybe those stars will give us some clues. Now, the scientists aren't suggesting that the sun's magnetic field is going to disappear. It's just that uh, it's possible that this activity, this, this solar cycle, will sort of come to a halt. The magnetic field will still be there, but um, all these sunspots and things might either disappear or become more static. We really don't know. So uh, there's, there's plenty we still don't know about the sun, Stuart. There's a huge link between sunspot activity and uh, weather conditions, weather patterns here on Earth. We had this thing called the Maunder the Minimum back in the 16 and 1700s. I was very young at the time, but uh, it, at one point it even caused the River Thames to freeze over. Yeah, yeah. the Maunder Minimum is an example of a, of a period where the sun seemed to go quiet. A bit of a, an anomalous period, it seems, and no one really knows why. So could we be heading towards sort of a longer-term Maunder Minimum sort of period? It's all speculative at the moment. It's interesting speculation and, you know, it's not going to affect any of us in our day-to-day lives really, so don't need to get too uh, worked up about it. But it's just really interesting the way that scientists can sort of try and figure out the sort of biology, if you like, of a, of a living star and try and work out uh, what its future is going to be. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. So when this new satellite, the TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, launches this year and over the next few years, the data starts to roll in and gets analysed, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with and their findings of other stars and what happens to solar cycles or stellar cycles and those other stars as they age. And as you mentioned earlier, as well as the Sun's magnetic field, the Earth also has a magnetic field. In the Earth's case, it's generated by a geodynamo. That's the planet's core revolving and uh, rotating slightly differently to the rest of the planet and that's acting like a, a generator making an electric field and every electric field is a magnetic field associated with it and that's the Earth's magnetic field and it's about to flip poles too according to everyone. The North and South Poles could flip at any time now. In fact, they're overdue. They're supposed to flip roughly every 200 to 250,000 years. But the last one was around I think 800,000 years ago. Yep, yep. There's certainly some suggestion that the uh, the Earth's magnetic field might flip too where North becomes South and South becomes North. In fact, there's a part in the South Atlantic off the coast of Argentina called the South Atlantic Anomaly, which is already showing bits of north polarity in what would otherwise be the southern polarity. Yeah, and, and the people who make and operate satellites have to be very careful mm. in that particular area as they send the satellites through and even uh, astronauts because it's a sort of a, a hole, if you like, not a, not a hole, but it's, it's a weaker spot in the Earth's magnetic field and, and particles from the sun and, and further out in space can get in there and, and cause you some damage if you're not prepared for it. What else is in the magazine? Well, we've been talking about the sun. Let's talk about some other stars this time. How did the stars get their names? We have a really fascinating article in the February issue of Australian Sky and Telescope that gives us the answers to where all these stars got their names. There are lots and lots of stars in the night sky, of course. There are about 6,000 stars visible or bright enough to be visible to the naked eye um, over the entire sky. We can only see about half of those at once, of course, because the night sky is only half the sky and the other half is daylight for the people on the other side of the planet at any particular time. And not all of those 6,000 stars have been given names, just all, all the bright ones. But those names, many of them go back thousands and thousands of years. The earliest star names that we still use, at least in the sort of scientific tradition, come from Mesopotamia, a long time back. There was a famous Mesopotamian star catalogue called Mul Apin, if I've pronounced that correctly, which dates back to about 750 BC. One of the names in it, for instance, was Mul Lugal. Again, I'm not going to get that pronunciation right, but M-U-L space L-U-G-A-L, which means kingly star. Now, that got translated somehow or other into the Greek and became Basiliskos, meaning the little king. And today we know it as Regulus, the brightest star in the constellation Leo. Leo the lion. Leo the lion, associated with kings and royalty and that sort of stuff, and this is the brightest star in that constellation. Other examples, there's the star Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S is how we spell it these days, and that came from a Greek word, Sirios, S-E-I-R-I-O-S, Sirios, and that means scorcher. That word actually means scorcher, presumably because even back then they realised that it was the brightest star in the night sky. Other famous ones, there's um, Betelgeuse, which comes from the Arabic Yad al Yorza. Or... Yeah, how do they get Betelgeuse? or Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, depending on which version you prefer, from that, that's so totally different. It's, it's a long, torturous process. Actually. Indeed. I won't go into it now, but it's, it's in the article in the magazine. It's really interesting to read, actually, wow. the yeah. sort of evolution of all these different names. But uh, yeah, Yad al Yorza became Betelgeuse. There's a star called Altair, right? Hmm. And that came from the Arabic al Nazar Altair, and that means the flying eagle, right? But there's another star called Vega, very famous sort of name, and its Arabic name was 
Al Nazar Al Waki, and that means the swooping eagle. So you get a couple of eagles in the sky. There are plenty more examples. There's um, Rigel, which uh, came from Rigel Al Yorza, which means the foot of the giant. I mentioned Betelgeuse, didn't say what it means. It means hand of the giant, because both of those stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse, are in the constellation Orion. Well, that's what we call it today, anyway. Orion the Hunter. Oh, there's, there's plenty more. There's um, Procyon, which came from the Greek Procyon, which means herald of the dog star, because Procyon is, or Procyon is in the constellation Canis Minor the small dog and Sirius is in the constellation Canis Major which is the large dog and they're very close together in the sky and one we mention quite a lot is uh, Antares which means the rival of Ares which is the word for Mars so there's plenty there really interesting stuff to find out how they got all these names and there's a lot of tortured sort of history going over thousands and thousands of years so that's also in the magazine and finally if you're in the market for some new astro gear starting off 2018 we present our pick of the 20 hottest new products for amateur astronomers there are full-on telescopes there are computerized tracking mounts special digital cameras that they use for astronomy there's software binoculars solar telescopes that you can look at the sun with quite safely and lots lots more Stuart. That's Jonathan Nally the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Chinese space officials say their Taiwangong-1 space station is still under control and will likely crash back to Earth in mid to late March. It's believed Beijing lost control of the orbiting outpost on March the 21st, 2016, after the spacecraft's battery charger failed, preventing the space station's two solar panels from recharging its batteries. This resulted in Mission Control losing their telemetry link and consequently, despite what they say, losing control of the space station. During observations in late November, Tiangong-1 had already dropped to an altitude of under 290 kilometres and was falling at a rate of about 10 kilometres per month. As the spacecraft hits thicker and thicker atmosphere, atmospheric drag will increase, causing the rate of orbital decay to accelerate. Based on current calculations, Tiangong-1 will crash back to Earth sometime in March. The 8.5 ton Tiangong-1 or Heavenly Palace in Chinese was launched back in September 2011 as Beijing's first space laboratory. The 10.4-metre-long space station was placed into a 362-kilometre-high orbit. It served as both a manned laboratory module and as an experimental test bed to demonstrate orbital rendezvous and docking capabilities. Tiangong-1 was never designed or planned to be a permanent orbital space station. Rather, it was always intended as a test bed for key technologies that would be used in Beijing's new modular space station slated for launch in 2023. Meanwhile, China has launched its latest pair of Bidu-3 navigation satellites into orbit. The spacecraft were launched on a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. The mission had been delayed from last year, following the failure of another Long March 3 to place the ChinaSat 9A satellite into its correct orbit. The new 1014 kilogram Bidu satellites are using a new design bus equipped with a phased array antenna for navigation signals and a laser retroreflector. Bidu stands for compass in Chinese. These satellites are the 26th and 27th in the planned 35 satellite navigation system constellation. Constellations expected to be completed in 2020. Virgin Galactic has carried out its first space plane drop glide test for 2018. During the descent, the VSS Unity achieved Mach 0.9 in the skies above California's Mojave Desert. Unity was dropped from its White Knight 2 mothership at high altitude, allowing the pilots to push the spacecraft's components to their limit, testing transonic flight performance, stability and vehicle control. This test was the first with Unity's silver thermal protection system fully applied. The system, known as TPS, ensures that heat loads generated by air friction during the rocket-powered boost and supersonic re-entry phase don't damage the spacecraft. The SpaceX CRS-13 capsule has returned to Earth, splashing down successfully in the North Pacific Ocean off the coast of Baja, California. The capsule was carrying 1,860 kilograms of return science experiments and equipment. Once safely aboard the recovery vessel, the Dragon was taken to Long Beach, California, where some of the cargo was removed for immediate return to NASA. The capsule and the rest of the cargo was then taken to SpaceX's McGregor facility in Texas for final processing. U.S. government officials are still refusing to say what happened to the top-secret SpaceX Zuma mission, which blasted off from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida earlier this month. 10, 9, 8, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition, lift off. Power and telemetry nominal. We have had successful liftoff of Falcon 9 carrying Zuma. We have cleared the tower, so we're now coming up on two events that is going supersonic and max Q. Now, maximum aerodynamic pressure is when we are at the point of maximum stress on the vehicle. From that point on, we're going through thinner and thinner atmosphere, so stress will continually decrease. And we've just passed max Q, so again, that means that as we ascend higher and higher, the atmosphere is thinner, and we do not need to have as much stress on the vehicle. Now, we're going to go through four events here in rapid succession, and those are in order, MECO, stage separation, SES-1, and the boost backburn. Now, MECO stands for main engine cutoff. That's when the first stage stops firing. There follows stage separation when first and second stage depart from each other. SES-1 is the third event. That stands for second engine start. That's when second stage begins firing. And then the fourth event in that sequence is the boost back burn. That's when first stage begins firing again to start its trajectory back to landing zone one. Now that sequence will occur at about 15 seconds in duration. Oh, seven, this is RC on countdown. Please uh, relinquish control of the camera, please. Roger. Eight have confirmed. Stage one is already split. Now we've had successful confirmation of, again, Miko, stage separation, second engine start, and the boost back burn. Now, the next major milestone is fairing separation. That should occur any second now. We will confirm that the fairings have separated, meaning that Zuma and second stage are the only vehicles continuing on to their final orbit. Stage one, boost back shutdown. Reports indicate the payload failed to separate from the Falcon 9 rocket's upper stage, with some speculation suggesting a problem with a new payload adapter that's designed to deploy the satellite from its upper stage once in orbit. And while Washington isn't saying anything, informed sources are suggesting the clandestine Zuma payload probably burnt up in the atmosphere, with its remains eventually splashing down into the Indian Ocean. The highly classified Zuma mission has been surrounded in secrecy ever since its inception. The launch was the first of some 30 flights on the SpaceX 2018 manifest, meaning a launch schedule of better than one flight every two weeks. Both the purpose and orbital target of the Zuma payload remain shrouded in a cloak of secrecy. Zuma was built by defence contractor Northrop Grumman and flown under an official US government-imposed news blackout, the company only confirming the mission was aiming for a LEO or low-Earth orbit. However, no US government agency, including the National Reconnaissance Office, which runs the government's classified spy satellite constellation, has claimed ownership of the payload. It's known that technical difficulties with the Falcon 9's new reusable protective payload fairing had delayed the Zuma mission since November. And just days before the launch, it was decided to fly the mission from Pad 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base instead of 39A at the Kennedy Space Center as originally planned because of the ongoing delays. Once the Falcon 9's upper stage placed Zoom into its correct orbit, the payload adapter should have triggered the release of the satellite from the upper stage. The adapter used on the Falcon 9 is usually supplied by SpaceX. However, on this occasion, Northrop Grumman insisted on using their own adapter. The next launch will be the maiden flight of SpaceX's new Falcon Heavy. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook. Just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 